Hi, boys and girls. It's Miss Kelly. And today we're going to read part four of The Speckled Band. Yes, it is the last part of the story where we find out if our inferences were correct. However, first I want to review this story. First, we have two main characters, Sherlock Holmes, who is a private investigator, which means that he gets paid by the person who is hiring him. And then we have Dr. Watson, who is Sherlock's sidekick kick or, or uh, assistant. Um, Dr. Watson narrates this story. And remember, they're fictional characters made up by the author, who happens to be Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Anyways, Helen Stoner came to see Sherlock Holmes to hire him to investigate her sister's death. Her sister's name was Julia Stoner, and she happened to die two years ago, which is kind of weird that Helen would come two years later to have Sherlock investigate the death. Well, it turns out that the, the coroner investigated in the local police, and they figured they couldn't find any evidence of her being murdered. They couldn't find um, any bite marks or uh, gun marks um, or, you know, well, really bullet, or um, poison, at least poison from England, um, around her. But they do know that she lived with a violent man. Her, their stepfather was extremely violent and had killed someone before, almost killed someone else, and was constantly getting into trouble. Matter of fact, he was even rude to Sherlock once he found out that Sherlock was on his tail. Anyways, the coroner thought, figured out that the only logical explanation was that Julia had died from fright. But we soon find out that that is just not the case. Helen and Julia were twins, and on the night that Julia met her fate, or her death, the two girls had been talking in Helen's room, and Julia had asked her some weird questions, like, Helen, have you heard a low whistle in the middle of the night? And Helen, of course, answered no. Because, and because she thought maybe it was coming from outside. But then Julia said, well, if it's coming out from outside, then why don't you hear it as well? And Helen's response was, well, maybe it's because I sleep harder than you. And anyways, on the night of her death, she had asked her those questions. And so Helen was aware. And then all of a sudden, she hears Julia scream, ah! And she runs out into the corridor, which is the hallway. And she finds Julia coming out, walking very, very uh, crazy, can hardly even stand up. And then she collapses, and right before she dies, she tells Helen it was the band, the speckled band, and points towards Dr. Roylott's room. Now, remember, we do know the motive. That motive is the money. The money came from the twins' mother. The mother, obviously, was married before to their father, and he had died, and then she died when they were only three. And Dr. Roylott had to start taking care of them. So he, the mother had left him money to take care of them. Now, of course, it was a lot of money back then. And the money is in pounds because they live in England. And I guess, you know, if the girls got married, the deal was that two weeks before, I mean, if the girls got married, he had to split the remainder of the fortune, because remember, he used that money to live on because he had been in jail and so he could have no job anyways. Um, he had to split the remainder of the money with the two girls. And so even though he didn't tell the girls they couldn't ever get married, lo and behold, Julia died two weeks before she was about to get married. And now Helen is coming two years later after Julia died because she too is about to get married and she is hearing now the same noises that frightened Julia 
right before she died. Not to mention Dr. Roylott has now moved Helen into Julia's old room. And Sherlock Holmes figured out that Julia's bed was clamped to the floor, that there was a bell rope above her bed, but it was fake, so she couldn't call anybody with it. And it was attached to a ventilator, which was also fake, because it was basically covering a hole between Dr. Roylott and Julia's room. In Dr. Roylott's room, Sherlock Holmes found a small a, a metal safe, which could have been that metal clang that Julia was hearing. And he found a small dog leash, even tied smaller, so it would fit maybe a smaller animal. And he found a milk saucer, which is like a teacup saucer, so it's very small, holding milk in it. And it was not big enough for the cheetah to drink. Now remember, he had a cheetah and a baboon on the property, but there was no way that the cheetah and baboon could have killed Julia. They couldn't have gotten in the room, first of all. And second of all, there was absolutely no marks that the cheetah and the baboon could have left. So it had to have been something else. But what? Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so let's start reading and see. Oh, and also Sherlock found a chair underneath the ventilator in Dr. Roylott's room as if Dr. Roylott had been standing on it. That's also very important. Let's start reading now and see what we find out and if we were correct. Okay, here we go. Part four of the Speckled Band. You see it, Watson? He yelled. But I saw nothing. At the moment when Holmes struck the light, I heard a low, clear whistle. But the sudden glare in my weary eyes made it impossible for me to tell what it was my friend lashed so savagely. I could, however, see that his face was deadly pale, filled with horror and loathing. Okay, boys and girls, so he heard a low, clear whistle, and he immediately started hitting the bell rope. But it's pitch black in there, so he can't see. He had ceased to strike and was gazing up at the ventilator when there broke from the silence of the night the most horrible cry to which I have ever listened. It swelled up louder and louder, a yell of pain and fear and anger all mingled into one dreadful shriek. Ah! It struck cold to our hearts, and I stood gazing at Holmes, and he at me until the echoes of it died away. What can it mean, I gasped. It means that it is all over, Holmes answered, and perhaps for the best. Take your pits- pistol and we shall enter Dr. Roylott's room. With a grave face, he lit the lamp and led the way down the corridor. Twice, he knocked at the door without any reply from within. Then he turned the handle and entered. I at his heels with the cocked pistol in my hand. A singular sight met our eyes. On the table stood a lantern with the shutter half open, throwing a brilliant beam of light upon the iron safe, the door of which was ajar. On the wooden chair sat Dr. Grimsby Roylott, clad in a long dressing gown. Across his lap lay the long leash we had noticed during the day. His chin was cocked upwards, and his eyes were fixed in a dreadful, rigid stare at the corner of the ceiling. Round his brow, he had a peculiar yellow band with brownish speckles, which seemed to be bound tightly around his head. He made neither sound nor motion. The speckled band, whispered Holmes. I took a step forward. In an instant, his strange headgear began to move, and there reared from his hair the squat diamond-shaped head and puffed neck of a loathsome serpent. Ah, boys and girls, it was a snake. It's a swamp adder, cried Holmes, the deadliest snake in India. He died within seconds of being bitten. 
Let us thrust this creature back into its den, and we can then remove Miss Stoner to some place of shelter and let the county police know what has happened. As he spoke, he drew the leash swiftly from the dead man's lap. Throwing the noose round the reptile's neck, he drew it from its perch and carrying it at arm's length, threw it into the iron safe, which he closed. Such are the facts of the death of Dr. Grimsby Roylott of Stoke Moran. The little I had yet to learn of the case was told to me by Sherlock Holmes as we traveled the next day. I had, said he, come to an entirely incorrect conclusion, which shows how dangerous it is to reason with insufficient data. The presence of the gypsies and the use of the word band put me on an entirely wrong scent. I reconsidered my position when it became clear that whatever danger threatened an occupant of the room could not have come from the window or the door. My attention was drawn to this ventilator and to the bell rope. The discovery that this was a dummy, which means fake, and that the bed was clamped to the floor so they couldn't move it, gave rise to the suspicion that the rope was a bridge for something passing through the hole and coming to the bed. The idea of a snake instantly occurred to me, and when I coupled it with my knowledge that the doctor was furnished with creatures from India, I felt that I was on the right track. The idea of using a form of poison which could not be discovered by any chemical test in England was just such a one as would occur to a clever and ruthless man who had spent his time in India. See, boys and girls, the coroner had tested for poisonous things in her body. But he could only, it was a long time ago, he could only test for poison that they knew of at that time. They were not, no, they didn't know stuff from other countries that was only, the animal was only there. Now, if the swamp adder would have been in England as well, they would have been able to figure it out. But this animal was only from India. Then I thought of the whistle. Of course, he must recall the snake before the morning light revealed to it vi the victim. So what he's saying here is he must call it back to him before the light comes in and Julia, or now Helen, could have seen the snake. He trained it, probably by the use of the milk that we saw in the saucer, to return to him when summoned. He would put it through the ventilator, certain that it would crawl down the rope and land on the bed. It might or might not bite the occupant that night. Perhaps she might escape every night for a week, but sooner or later, she must fall victim, meaning the snake will bite her sooner or later. So that's why Julia heard it for at least two weeks because he had been putting it in there. The snake just hadn't bitten her until that last night, and then that killed her. Luckily, it didn't bite Helen on the first night, or sh this story would never have taken place. I had come to these conclusions before ever I had entered the room. An inspection of his chair showed me that he had been in the habit of standing on it to reach the ventilator. The side of the safe, the saucer of milk, and the loop of cord were enough to dispel any doubts that remained. The metallic clang heard by Miss Stoner was caused by her stepfather hastily closing the door of his safe. So hastily means quickly. Having made up my mind, you know the steps I took to put the matter to the proof. I heard the creature hiss, as no doubt you did also, and I instantly attacked it. So that low whistle was the snake hissing, driving it through the ventilator and also causing it to turn upon its master at the other side. The blows of my cane roused its temper so that it flew upon the first person it saw. In this way, I am indirectly responsible for Dr. Grimsby Roylott's death. I cannot say that it is likely to weigh heavily upon my conscience. Ah, so Dr. Roylott killed Julia with a snake from India, and he would send it through the ventilator every night, and it would go down the bell rope 
into Julia's bed and then that first night into Helen's bed. And he would leave it in there a couple of hours. And then he trained it with his whistle sound to come back to him. He'd give it a little treat of milk and then he'd put it safely away back in the uh, safe and just close that door quickly because, you know, it was very poisonous. And he, he did this until finally it killed Julia. Luckily, Sherlock figured this out before it killed Helen. Okay, boys and girls, so the motive was that the money that he was going to have to give the girls, he was going to have to share that money with Julia and Helen, and there was only a little bit left, so each girl was, each person was going to get about 250 pounds, which is not enough, apparently, for Dr. Roylott. And remember, that was a lot of money still back then because it was a long time ago. Things cost a whole lot less. Who killed Julia? Ah, it was Dr. Roylott. Because even though he didn't personally kill her, he placed all the things for the snake to get into her room and place the snake in her room to kill her. So who killed Julia? It was Dr. Roylott. What killed Julia? It was the snake. And how did he kill it? He sent it through. He stood on his chair. He sent it through the ventilator, down the bell rope into the room, and then he would blow the whistle before the sun came up to call it back in. He'd give it a little treat of milk from that saucer, and then he'd slam the safe closed. There you have it, boys and girls. I hope you enjoyed this story. It's always a fun story to read. I sure do miss you guys. Talk to you later. Bye.